um, just letting me know exactly where you are. It looks like a number of you are beginners. That just kind of tells me um, where to go, how much to talk about any one subtopic, so forth and so on. Um, I have taken two additional minutes from you. I promise I will make that back up to you and make it worth your while. Um, continue putting that information in there and I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So um, again, my name is Kaniga or K.A. Perkins. I'm a deputy director of what is now called SBA's Mentor Protege Program. Some of you might know us as the All Small Mentor Protege Program, um, but officially on November 16th, um, our name changed as we combined our Mentor Protege Program with the 8A Mentor Protege Program. So before the 16th of last month, they were two separate programs um, with identical uh, benefits, uses, purposes, and whatnot. Um, now they are a single program. So what I'm gonna talk to you about today is avoiding pitfalls um, when you apply and once you're a participant in the program. So let's see, let me scroll down here. Okay, so we're gonna start with an overview. And just so that you know, there's essentially eight things I'm gonna talk you about today, just so you can kind of get the breadth of what I'll speak of as I go into greater detail throughout the presentation. So first, I'm going to give an overview. The overview is basically going to tell you what our program does, um, how the protege and the mentor may benefit from utilizing our program, and what the overall end game is. So once you participate in the program, you should be able to accomplish X. Um, also, I will go over eligibility. So in other words, um, what does it take to get into the program? Three, the application process. Um, how do you apply? What websites do you go to? Uh, when you're applying, so forth and so on. And that's where a lot of the pitfalls are, by the way. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, next, maintaining eligibility. So you're in the program. How do you stay in the program? So that's the fourth thing. The fifth thing is the final rule. Remember earlier I referred to November 16th as a date where two programs merged? Well, there were a number of rule changes that happened that were effective as far as the rule was concerned um, November 16th, and then those rule changes are, are implemented 30 days thereafter. Um, I'll go over some of those rule changes and how they affect you. Um, then the pitfalls. So what's the, what's the best way to apply, the best way to stay in the program, the best way to go about joint ventures? So if you've heard of my program, a lot of you are thinking, okay, joint ventures. She hasn't said that word yet. Um, I'm going to, you know, kind of help you understand the differences between mentor protege vernacular and joint venture vernacular. At SBA, they are two separate tools. Um, and then resources. It's great that we're getting together today during this unprecedented time to actually learn more about this program, but I want you to be able to take away information uh, after today. So I, I think studies show that after um, you listen to a presentation or you take a training, you may retain about 8% of what you heard. I want you to be able to take it, take away with you additional information. Uh, should you have questions, you can go to certain resources first or contact my office specifically. So back to the overview. So what are the benefits of being in this program? So um, one is you can get support from your mentors. So one type of support is management and technical assistance. You can receive financial assistance as well. Um, contracting assistance. The best example of that for those of you interested in joint ventures is just that, a joint venture. International trade education is another. Business development assistance and administrative assistance. These are the six types of support or business development that a protege may receive 
from his or her mentor. Okay, and so what, if, if you're looking at this as far as like tiers, so, you know, what can you actually receive or um, glean from this program? One is business development. That was the previous slide. So the example that I like to use is QuickBooks. Um, we, you know, most of us know what QuickBooks is. So, um, you know, let's say I'm deficient in QuickBooks. I'm a protege. I want to pair up with a mentor. I find that mentor. That mentor, um, you know, promises to teach me how to use QuickBooks. So that's a type or, or an oversimplified example of business development. Subcontracts. So technically speaking, subcontracting is something that you could do uh, without being a part of this program. It's simply a prime going after work, receiving a contract award, subbing out some portion of that work, a subcontractor being the one that actually completes um, performance on said work. However, when you're a part of this program, it's kind of a, I guess, maybe a formalized relationship. So um, the protege can perform on some of the mentors contracts. They have this relationship where they have this agreement, this business development, and the mentor is, is training the protege essentially. The mentor has contracts on which the protege may perform work. And then the top tier is joint ventures. So see joint ventures this way, if you will. So you have a protege, you have a mentor, the protege and the mentor must be separate entities. And together, the protege and the mentor form a temporary entity. That temporary entity is a joint venture. So how does this kind of play out? Like how did, how did these words relate to each other? So just really quickly, um, the reason why a mentor protege team would want a mentor protege agreement in order to receive or uh, to form a joint venture is to receive what we call a waiver to affiliation. So um, that is it. one way of looking at it is this. So let's say the protege is um, a Wellsby, a woman owned small business. Through the joint venture, if they have a mentor protege agreement, that joint venture is also a um, Wellsby joint venture. So if that weren't the case, then the protege and the mentor could very possibly size out for a particular NAICS code. Um, a NAICS code is like a, a categorization of work, if you will. Um, goes a little bit beyond the, the scope of this presentation, but just for those of you who don't know, um, and you have to be a certain size if you're talking about something other than manufacturing. So um, the protege and the mentor essentially get together, form a temporary entity and go after contracts together that neither one of the, those firms would be able to go after alone. Okay, so what's the end result? So the program is six years and at the end, the end game is that the protege would be able to expand uh, his or her capacity and to bid independently. Okay, so not to brag, but our program is really new. It began in 2016 and I just looked at this yesterday and since 2016, my office, which I call tiny and my, there are only four analysts, two of which take care of applications. The other two take care of annual evaluations. And we have approved more than 1,398 MPAs. And that was as of yesterday. So we are moving and shaking. You guys are doing some great things in the federal marketplace. Just wanted to give you some perspective um, as far as what um, you guys have been able to achieve through this program. So eligibility. So how do you get in? So you get in by being these things. You must be a for-profit business. There must be no determination of affiliation. You must be, remember that word, next code? You have to be small 
or your NAICS code. Um, the mentor may not invest more than 40% equity in protege's business. And the protege may have no more than two mentors in a lifetime. And uh, no more than three protege, this is for the mentor, at any one time. Okay, so that's what it takes to get in. So you got the overview, you're interested, you're eligible, you want to apply. Um, this is how the process is going to look. And I'm just going to click through these and then explain them. So the first thing you're going to do as a protege is you're going to select your mentor. Um, our program is not a matchmaking program, so you must have your mentor in mind before you apply. And as my own personal public service announcement, proteges and mentors alike, be very care, very careful, if you will, about who you marry. So especially for proteges, you only have two bites at that apple and then we are done. Um, so select your mentor very carefully. You can select your mentor in a number of ways. So one is if you know, for example, which agency has the type of work that you're able to perform, see who's getting the work. Go into um, different government systems. A good one is um, FPDSNG or just FPDS.gov. Federal Procurement Data Systems is what that stands for. That's one way to see who is getting the work. Um, my office has an active list of mentor protege agreements. Um, you can honestly, the best way to find it is to Google it. Um, simply put in, um, you know, your protege program active list and it will come up. We update that list monthly. And you can see which mentors on that list. That would be another way. Uh, another way that I like to suggest, this is kind of the long game, but it's a little safer. And that is, um, you know, finding some out there, networking the way you, you already know how to do, and then subcontracting with that mentor first before deciding to get married, if you will. So moving on. Step number two, you selected your mentor, you want to register in SAM. That's beta.sam.gov. Um, every firm wanting to work for the federal government must be registered in the systems acquisition management site. Next, you're going to go through certify. Um, certify, is it uh, sba.certify.gov or certify.gov, I believe? Going to go to certify, and that's where you're going to apply. Now, this slide says allow for 90 days. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. We have a two step process. That's not wrong, but it is a little incomplete. The first step is we're going to screen your case. Um, like I said, we have two analysts who are doing this. So um, they're going to take 15 days to screen the case. 90 days to process the case. Um, I'm, I'm saying this and I'm saying this wholeheartedly, plan accordingly. So if you see a procurement and it closes in two weeks, we do not have a process for expediting cases. For every case that we expedite, that is one case that gets pushed aside. So please plan accordingly. Um, make sure that you submit a clean case. I'm gonna go into that in a little bit. Um, and by the way, we no longer um, do reconsiderations and I'll, I'll go into that um, a little bit later. And then step number five on this slide is to remain responsive. So the email address that you use and certify is the one that one of my analysts will use to contact you. Stay tuned to your email, stay tuned to your inbox. Stay tuned to your spam folder. Sometimes our emails may go in spam. So um, if we send you a request for additional information, 
you have only five days to rectify whatever issue is either an error or omission in your application or else your application is either uh, withdrawn if they are looking at the screening stage or it's declined if they are looking at the processing stage. Uh, and, and really quickly, someone asked a question. Um, I'm looking at the chat as I'm going through this. Um, what does it mean to screen a case? To screen a case basically means the analyst is looking for to make sure that um, at a high level, everything that's supposed to be there is there. So there should be two certificates. Um, there should also be a business plan. We're, we're no longer reviewing business plans, but there should also be um, a mentor protege agreement. And this is one that trips people up a lot. So please, if you have fallen asleep, if you could wake up for the next five seconds, that would be awesome. So if you or the mentor, if one of you has another MPA, either if it's with SBA or a, even another agency, and you say that you have another one, which we, you know, you are, um, saying that you're being honest when you are applying to this program, we just need a copy of that. So that's one of the things that trips people up when they're applying. That's one of the reasons why many applications get declined or withdrawn. Okay. And I'm gonna skip this uh, slide. Um, this changed as of November 16th. So there is no such thing as an 8A transfer. And to answer another question, no, you do not need to be an 8A necessarily. You need to be a qualifying small business. So that's the reason why initially we were called the All Small Mentor Protege Program because it's for all eligible small businesses. So uh, maintaining eligibility. So you see the benefits, you're interested, you're applying for the program, you're in the program, congratulations, and now you wanna figure out how to stay in the program. So, very high level, the protégés must submit annual reports. So notice that there's a lot of responsibility on the protégé. It's because you are the reason why this program exists. We need to know that this program actually benefiting you. So yes, a lot of the onus will be on the protege to um, maintain compliance and eligibility. So the protege must submit annual reports. Oh, there we go. Uh, the protege must also demonstrate uh, material or develop developmental rather benefits like, like I was mentioning. And if you have a joint venture, then you first need to fill out a certificate of compliance. It's just a one pager that comes with your welcome letter when you've made it in. And once you receive a contract award, um, you are required to send us quarterly financial reports. For mentors, mentors simply provide a meaningful or meaningful assistance as described in the agreement. So at a very high and probably oversimplified level, if my mentor promises to show me how to use QuickBooks, then my mentor must um, be dedicated to, um, to that notion. So and by the way, because we're not a matchmaking program, we do not uh, recommend mentors. Okay. So please note, as we're talking about maintaining eligibility, that this agency reserves the right to terminate an agreement for non-compliance, meaning um, you have not completed your annual evaluation if, or if the mentor hasn't provided proper assistance. This last point, just scratch it out. Um, you know, we're, we're creating a new presentation actually as we speak. So this part no longer applies, but I will tell you what applies. So what we used to do was kind of a, a three and three. So when someone would um, receive an MPA, we would say, okay, that is valid from what's today, uh, December you know, 10th of 2020 to 
uh, December 10th of 2023. And then at that point, you have to apply or do something, some act in order to extend that agreement. And then we may or um, we may or may not you know, extend your MPA for another three years. So over the last year or so, we've changed our interpretation of that to uh, better represent what is in 13 CFR 125.9, and that is the regulation that governs this program. So instead, uh, which is easier for all of you, uh, instead what we say is this agreement will automatically um, renew for up to six years unless SBA or one of the participants terminates the agreement. Okay, and so the final rule. So remember, I keep referring to this November 16th date. There were some rule changes that happened. What does this all mean? Why do I care about it? Why is it important to me? So here's some of the things that changed with the final rule that I think um, are important for you to know, especially for protégés. So for protégés, um, now we have an actual um, ability to annul a, an MPA within the first 18 months. So the way it used to work was, again, protege firms have two bites at the apple. And if, you know, one of those marriages didn't work out, then you could terminate, you can voluntarily terminate the agreement, but that would count against your two. So with the final rule, if you are within the first 18 months and you meet certain conditions, um, then you may be able to annul your MPA without it affecting uh, or going against your, your two allotted um, bites at the apple. Okay, um, another rule change is that a mentor's good character is not required for us to evaluate in every instance. Um, this is something that we, we do look at and that we're uh, digging deeper into, um, but this isn't something that we're necessarily required to do. This one is more of a clarification, if anything. So mentors cannot submit competing offers, which this is a clarification as well. Meaning if a mentor, remember mentors can have up to three uh, concurrent MPAs with, you know, therefore three different protege firms. If there is um, a solicitation that's on the street out there and this mentor wants to put in two proposals through two different joint venture relationships, that is clearly a conflict of interest and that mentor is clearly competing those protege firms against each other, which is not permitted. And again, another clarification, um, a mentor may not inject any more than 40% equity into a protege's firm. Um, something that was discussed, but it didn't change at all. Um, this is more just um, anecdotal than anything. Um, there was a request by some people in the, in the community during the rulemaking process um, for SBA to um, to, I guess, propose some limits uh, for mentors earning more than a hundred million. Um, so basically they wanted SBA to make a distinction between um, other than small businesses that were less than a hundred million in revenue and those that were greater than a hundred million in revenue. And um, that's been brought up before, I think, on some other um, rules, but that has not changed. And other, you are either small or you are other than small, and that is as far as we drill down. And then finally, um, remember how I said mentors may have up to three um, MPAs at once with three different protégés. Well, there's an exception to that rule if if the protege or if the mentor rather has their principal place of business in puerto rico then they may have up to five so essentially um 
the the first two don't count. Okay, so joint ventures. So some things that change with the final rule as it relates to joint ventures are um, no joint venture approval from SBA, including competitive 8 JV. So what does this mean? So before the final rule, the way that things went um, in the 8A program was that the district office reviewed and approved every joint venture. With the changing of this rule, the district office will no longer review and approve 8A joint ventures unless it is an 8A sole source requirement. That is the only exception for any other joint venture, um, especially, you know, well, for any other joint venture period, um, SBA will not review and approve it. So if the question is, well, who does, it is the contracting activity. They review and approve uh, the joint venture. Okay, so a big thing that changed was the three and two rule. So the way things used to go is that um, joint ventures were limited to, to earning only three or up to three contracts within a two year period. So the way it stands now, joint ventures may receive an unlimited number of contracts within that two-year period. Okay, and then another one is that facility security officers may be administrative personnel, and this gets more into, um, well, not only faci facility security uh, clearances and whatnot, but what it means to be um, an administrative personnel. This is more about the 40% and who must do what amount of work, so forth and so on. It, it gets a little bit into the weeds, but um, that's kind of a, a general overview of that. And that point I've gone over, so I'm gonna move forward into pitfalls. So where are the pitfalls at each stage and how can we avoid them? So if you remember earlier, I talked about um, what it takes to apply to this program and submitting a clean case. So there are essentially four things that this office needs when you apply. So you go in and certify, you fill out everything, you upload some stuff. So what's the stuff? You need two tutorial certificates. So if you go on our site and you see a video, there's a video you take as the protege that the mentor takes. There is a certificate at the end. You save those PDFs, you upload them into certify, boom, done. Next is the MPA. So this is kind of a moot point now um, or becoming a moot point because we're all one program now, but we wanna make sure that you're using the right uh, mentor protege agreement. It's on our site, it's updated. Um, so simply go on our site, download that certificate and manipulate it as as you will with regard to your the business assistant and sign accordingly. And I always say use the smart model when you're talking about the QuickBooks, like what what is the business development? So make sure that those goals are are clear, that they're you know quantitative, that they're they're measurable. I make sure it's not just, you know, we're going to get together every now and then and go over some stuff. That's that's not good enough for the MPA. So make sure that your your goals, how you're going to measure success, so forth and so on, are clear within your MPA. Third, NAICS codes. So if you are applying under a primary NAICS code, you're you're done. No need to give us proof of experience. It's going to be assumed. If you are applying under a secondary NACE code, then we're going to need proof. That proof needs to come from you. Ordinarily, that proof would be in the form of a contract. Please pay attention to that. That is another area where people get declined a lot and they say, I don't know what happened and no one told me, I'm telling you. So if you were applying under a secondary NACE code, make sure to give us proof of experience in that secondary NACE code. 
And by the way, with the final rule, we've actually quantified what that looks like. So you need to have one year of actual experience in that secondary NAICS code, or um, at least two years of actually um, managing that type of experience. And then finally, the, the business plan, um, which I might be obsolete at this point. I'm going to leave it in there just for grins for now. Um, but originally, um, our requirement is that it must align with our areas of assistance. So, in, in other words, um, before anyone asks any questions about that, uh, let's say that this is an extreme example, but let's say that um, you are going into, you know, construction and everything in your your uh, MPA is about um, building that that part of your business in construction. And if your business plan talks about basket weaving, then clearly your business plan does not align um, with your MPA. So extreme example, but I think it's a fact. Okay, so 10 pitfalls to avoid in our program. So. When you're applying, upload all your documents. Submit um, the MPA that is specific to this office. It is on our site and make sure that those metrics that you use for business development make sense. Make sure, again, just use the SMART model. Um, provide proof of experience for a second NAICS and stay in contact with us. It's, um, I say here, especially for reconsiderations, but we're no longer doing them with regard to the final rule. So uh, that one will be removed from, from the presentation. But stay in contact with us. If you provided, um, you know, xyz at uh, gmail.com, then keep track of that email, keep track of that inbox, keep track of that spam. If you receive that letter, know that you have five days. Um, I'm from the Midwest where we say get her done. So go ahead and get that done and uh, we can move forward. Okay, so top 10 pitfalls to avoid with AEs or what we call annual evaluations. So making any changes, they have to come through us before the change can be made. Um, that is in 13 CFR 125.9. So if you are, you know, um, changing a type of business assistance. Let's say you're going from management and technical assistance and now you want to focus solely on contracting assistance, for example, then we need to be aware of that change. If there is a buy-sell agreement, an acquisition, merger, so forth and so on, we need to know about that beforehand and not afterwards. Um, also ensure that your accomplishments match your initial MPA. So, there is a survey that you take in Survey Monkey. So when I talk about accomplished, that accomplishments rather, that's what I'm referring to. So when you're um, notating what your accomplishments are, they need to match up with what was in the initial agreement. Again, this is a federal program. So when we're evaluating um, your experience, your performance in the program, um, it helps us to know that you've stayed on track. Um, and again, stay compliant, compliant rather, <laughs> excuse me, and complete the evaluations timely. And yes, we do terminate when agreements are not completed timely. And for pitfalls and joint ventures, please understand that you have, if you are wanting a waiver to affiliation, you're wanting to participate in this program and have your joint venture stem from that MPA, your MPA comes first, the joint venture second. So you come through our program, you get approved, you form the, the joint venture. Can I also say, make sure that when you apply for your MPA, it is under the protege duns. Don't create a joint, we shouldn't be creating a joint venture anyway first, but don't put it under the joint venture duns, of course. Don't put it under the mentors duns. Um, make sure that it is under the protege's Duns. Also, submit your uh, joint venture compliance form. That's that one pager that I talked about as part of your welcome letter. Make sure you give us that the moment you form a joint venture, 
And uh, once you start receiving awards and that money and that work starts come flying in, then give us those quarterly financials um, also so that you can remain compliant. Okay, so more about joint ventures. I think I'm still in pretty decent time here. Um, MPA approval is required prior to joint venture bid on an award. That's another way of saying MPA first, joint venture second. Um, remember, we do not review or approve joint ventures. The only exception is the third bullet. SBA district offices approve joint, approve joint ventures for 8A contracts, and that is for sole source only, not for competitive. Next, MPA joint ventures are granted exclusions from affiliation. That's why you have to do it in order. You have to form the mentor protege or um, have it approved rather, and then form the joint venture. Um, the next bullet changed as a as a result of the final rule. Again, um, our presentation or slide deck is a work in progress right now. So you can scratch the three and two and two rule. It's an unlimited number of contracts within a two-year period. Next, recurring activities must consider work done individually by each partner of the joint venture as well as any work done by the joint venture itself. And for any of you who have the question of, well, what does that look like and how much is that? I don't have an answer for that. So that is up to the contracting officer to determine exactly how they're going to evaluate a protege's past performance versus a mentor's past performance versus that of the joint venture. Um, and as far as performance, speaking of which, the protege must perform at least 40% of that work. The mentor may not perform more than 60. Okay. So resources. Remember, um, this is one of the last things I really wanted to leave all of you with. So it's, it's great to go through the slides, to give you an overview, um, so that you can see like, okay, this is what our program is about. This is how I may benefit from a 30,000 foot view. Um, but I want, you know, you're going to think about stuff, you know, afterwards, you know, you might be getting ready for, for work tomorrow and, and have a question while in the shower. Well, um, here's some resources for you so that you know exactly where to go um, and what to look up if you have those questions. Okay. So rules, I love rules. So let's talk about rules. Um, so this is basically um, kind of what 13 CFR looks like in a sense. So it's designed to be really user friendly and it's based under certain questions, certain questions that you may have, like um, under what circumstances can a joint venture be awarded an 8A contract? So that's under 124.513. Um, if you're a hub zone or you're interested in becoming a hub zone and you have, you see this question, what requirements must a joint venture satisfy to submit an offer and be eligible to perform specifically on a hub zone contract? So that's under 126.616. So um, there are regs all over 13 CFR, they're SBA regs. Um, and I wanted to put those in this presentation so that you guys can actually know exactly where to look when you have a question. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention my own office, which is at the bottom on the left-hand side. What are the rules governing SBA, Small Business Mentor Protege Program? And intentionally, I have mentioned that regulation ad nauseum, which is 13 CFR 125. Point nine. Okay, and from it just kind of scaling back a little bit, um, this is kind of where all the small business program stuff is in 13 CFR. So I put my office at the top, this is my presentation, I can do that. Um, then there's SBA size regulations. Um, just 
my advice as someone who I, I never did talk about my career, um, but it might help to know that um, I come from federal procurement. I did um, contracting as an 1102 for six and a half years for the General Services Administration in Kansas City. So um, I know procurement, I know it fairly well. Um, I stay certified, I like rules a whole lot. Um, so I'm, I'm telling you all this because you see where it says SBA size regulations, which is 13 CFR 121. No one ever talks about that section. I really suggest you read it. Um, I feel like a lot of issues that happen in procurement or small business programs, um, they somehow touch section 121. Um, there are people I work with who have procurement backgrounds who you know, strongly suggested that I read that section. There's a lot of good information in there. I suggest that you do. But for all types of stuff, as you can see here, certificates of competency, um, SBA prime contracting, the non-manufacturing rule, um, small disadvantaged businesses, SBA subcontracting, like there's a section for virtually everything um, that SBA touches. I wanted you to know exactly where that is. So, and then I wanted to let you know that there are other mentor protege programs. Now, a lot of those were streamlined and I believe that was 2016, um, with SBA being the predominant program for all things mentor protege. But there are some other programs out there that are very specific to those agencies' respective missions. And here they are. So you've got DOD, NASA, Homeland Security, uh, the FAA, Department of Transportation and DOE. So those are the other uh, programs that are out there. And you've gone through those regs, you have read stuff back and forth, you put yourself to sleep a million times, you still cannot figure out the answer to your question and you need some support. So here are some things I suggest. Um, this website eventually is changing, but it, it works currently. Um, since our name is changing, our website would change as well, right? So um, this link still works. So go to our website and find out more, uh, just kind of overview information about our program. That's one place you can go. And um, remember earlier, I, someone was asking, well, how do I find a mentor? And one of the things I suggested was to look at the active list of mentor protege agreements. So this is the actual site, you can Google it too, but this is the actual site for it. And then the joint venture guide, I love this thing. It's, it's antiquated, it looks like it was written um, a whole lot of years ago, but it's still pretty valid as far as I'm concerned and use it. So when you're trying to figure out like, okay, how do I put this thing together for this agency? What do I do? Go to this site. It's actually, um, I can't remember how many pages it is, if it's, if it's three or five pages or something like that, but really a really good resource um, when you're putting together your joint venture. And if you have any questions, um, I don't know why one went blank on here, but um, one resource is uh, just to contact me. Um, I go by KA, but my first name is Kanika. So uh, first name dot last name at SBA.gov. I was brave and daring enough to put my cell number on there. What was I thinking? I'm just kidding. Uh, feel free to give me a call. And um, if I happen, oh, there's number one. So number one is to uh, contact the inbox. It's kind of like contacting me. I'm the one who um, is over it. So it, you know, um, what's that expression? Six, six and a half and one. Anyway, I always get that screwed up. But my point is, um, contact me at either uh, number one or number two. And my boss is number three. Um, his name is Stanley Jones Jr. And I was brave enough to put his word number 
an email address on here, but we are here for you. Um, we really want you to build that capacity that you want to build. And I really hope that this gave you at least some building blocks on whether, you know, deciding whether this is the right program for you or how to apply or maybe ignited some, some additional interest or even questions that you might have. And so with that, we have 13 whole minutes left um, and I'm, I'm up for questions. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was absolutely fantastic, full of great information. And we have a ton of questions because I realized um, as you were doing your presentation that a lot of people were posting the questions just to me, so I don't think you're able to see them. One of the first ones oh, though okay. is, will the, I know a lot of the information, some of the information you said in your presentation is out of date. Will you be able to send me an updated one when it's done so I can share with the, the audience? Uh, I don't have an issue with that, but I also don't have a date on that. We have a, okay. a contractor that's um, doing that honestly as we speak and i i honestly do not know when they'll be finished but i, I can tell you that um we do that well i do these all the time um so if some time passes and and you ask me you're like hey I, I need a new presentation i'm happy to share it okay that's fine and it's as i said at the top at this um top of this present uh webinar sure. that I will be sending this presentation to you shortly by email, so you will have a copy of it. This is also being recorded, um, so the video will be on our website tomorrow. I will include the link to that as well. Okay, so should I just go through some of the questions? Because I don't think you can see them. Can you care? Uh, sure. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Well, I'll go back to the first one. Can we have more than one mentor? Yes. So okay. you can have... Um... I kept using that phrase like two bites at the apple. So proteges can have two lifetime MPAs. You can have them concurrently. You can have them at different times. Right. Do you have, does SVA have a list of primes seeking proteges to train? No. Again, um, I, I sound like I'm a broken record, so I apologize, but we are not a matchmaking program. Okay. So That's that fun. you know, we we don't we don't generate the, the dates, if you will. Um, you just have to network and, and find someone you're comfortable working with. Okay. Do you have any tips on how I can find a mentor? Um, I I did answer this one, but I'm I'm happy to go over it again. Um, that you know, there's a number of ways to do it. So I started at this agency working at the district office level. So when you're at the district office, um, you're more deeply rooted into a community. And for me, that was San Antonio, Texas. Um, so there's a, in San Antonio, there were a lot of different community events out there that were deeply rooted in federal procurement as well as state procurement. Um, and you, the more you start Participating in those, and I and I know we're we're living in an outlier right now with COVID, right? But I'm I'm talking about normal times. Um, so when you're, the more you participate in events like that, you start to see some of the same players. You start to introduce yourself to those players and kind of build relationships from there. That's one way. Another way is really by looking at fpds.gov to see who's getting the work, um, attending. Uh, things like industry days and other government type events for procurement um, because you're going to be able to see who's interested and who your competition may be. Um, but just really staying tuned to who the players are through market research, through community outreach, um through events like this even i mean i know this one is virtual but when it's in-house you're able to see people um swap business cards so forth and so on um it, it's just it really is just kind of like anything else okay great next one so forgive me if i re if i ask you a question that you answered earlier on i was just making a note of all the questions um no people have joined at different times 
Uh, next one is where can we find the conditions for the annulment of a mentor protege program? So the existent, uh, let me let me put it like this. So anytime there is a, a rule, um, it's part of the federal register. Now that's not going to drill down into there's five things that you must do starting with. It's not going to drill down into that, but that gives you the, the breadth of rules that are changing um, with regard to any particular office. So since this is pretty new, um, we still need to update our own SOP um, as well as our own desk guide, but there isn't anything published currently that says how. Now, I have firms that contact my office or some of my um, AE analysts directly, and we're kind of working through some of those. I actually have some of those I need to do um, this week. But the short answer, before I start babbling, the short answer is that's not out there yet. Okay, next one. Is an SBA mentor protege considered different from an NGA or DIA mentor protege? Yes. Yes. Okay. So anyone who has their own program through some statutory authority or, or whatever it is, theirs is different from ours. It's not a matter of like good, better. It, it's not that. It's just that um, our agency's mentor protege program is the predominant one for the federal government by which you can form um, an MPA, a JV off of that MPA and go after federal contracts. A lot of times those other agency um, programs are very specific to their procurements, their mission and their goals. So it's not like you could um, become part of like the DOD mentor protege program and go after Department of Transportation contracts. I, I, don't, I don't think you would be able to do that or would want to do that. So you would be more indoctrinated in their goals, their mission, and, and those requirements, if, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Next one is, if you get de declined or withdrawn, does that mean you lose one of your two chances with a mentor? No, it's not a gotcha program. What we're saying is you need to go in to certify, and if you're still interested, and then rectify whatever whatever those errors or omissions are and then let us know that you've made those changes um, and then I will personally reassign you to one of the analysts and that essentially restarts the clock. Okay. So it but applying and getting declined does not remove one of your opportunities. We're we're not a punitive program. All right. To form a JV that will have to be approved by SBA due to sole source, does the MPA have to be in place before forming the JV? The MPA always has to be in place before forming a, a JV in order to receive the waiver to affiliation. Okay. So the short combined? answer, yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, next one. The compliance form requires a contract number. If the contract has not been awarded yet, how do we submit the compliance certification? Oh, that's based on you forming a joint venture, not on contract award. So, um, and I, I, I can see how you mix those up because I, I kept talking about two things kind of together. So this is what I was saying. So you get your MPA, great. You form your JV, great. The moment you form your JV, you fill out this one pager that comes with your welcome letter called a certificate of compliance and you give that to us. So that's that's one thing that, that you do. Um, and then once you receive a JV award, then you start to submit to us quarterly financials. That is a whole separate action. Okay, thanks. Is the updated SBA MP program more geared for small businesses just starting out 
versus businesses that have been around for 20 years but are still looking for mentorship? Um, I would say both and neither at the same time. So, I mean, it really does depend on what your goals are. This is a federal program that is rooted in the federal marketplace. So whether you um, whether you are a protege just starting out and, and well, you know what, I'll wait a second before I give my public service announcement on that. But even if you are experienced um, and you're still wanting to participate either as a mentor or a protege, um, if it's a good fit for where you are in your business at that point and where you want to go, then I don't think it's a better or worse fit. I just think it depends on where you are uh, with your business goals. But my per my public service announcement is this. Um, I often tell people, especially with regards to some of these certifications like 8A, 8A is like a one and done program, right? So you get like one chance at it. It's nine years, it's over and done. So I often suggest that people really know their business and then know their business in the federal marketplace before becoming an 8A. So people tend to get these certifications really early. I used to be a BOS and manage a portfolio of 8A companies. And I can't tell you how many times a company would say, and I really wish I would have waited because by the time I understand what to do, it's like year six <laughs> and it's hard to kill it, if you will, in three more years. So it's, it's a really good idea to understand the federal marketplace before um, becoming certified as an 8A, for example. So just, you know, I gave you that for free. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, just one last question and then we're going to have mm -hmm. to wrap it up. Sure. Um, this one is when contacting potential mentors, do we call them? Do we send them letters? How do we communicate with them to invite however, them to become our mentor? However you would otherwise. Um, you know, one thing that you could do is one is to research them. You know, I've, I've seen, and I'll, I'll try to make this as succinct as possible. I know we're just about out of time, but I've seen a, um, some instances where a protege goes after a mentor just because they have a high revenue. But if they have a high revenue and the two of you don't have the same business acumen, if they have high revenue, but no federal or procurement experience, then it's kind of like the blind leading the blind. So make sure you research them and then just, you know, call them for an interview or in these days, a virtual interview um, to see if the two of you are a good fit. And if you think you are, try subbing for them first. I always say sub for them. There, there's, very, there's less risk in that than there is becoming, you know, um, part of this program and then losing one of your two because you made a choice that you you know, later regret it. So we'll end with that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kanika. This has been fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for participating. I just want to let you know that this has probably one been one of our biggest webinars. We had over 230 people register and 160 attend. So this shows how popular this topic is. So hopefully, Kanika, we can have you back later in 2021 if you're up for it. Sure, sure. I, I love this stuff and I love that you guys are so interested in building capacity. Um, and just final word, um, I hope all of you and yours are doing well and I want you to stay safe out there. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yep. Ditto to that. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. I'm going to send you this presentation. I'm going to send you a link to the replay, which will be available from tomorrow. Thank you again to our, um, our, our guest presenter, Kanika Perkins. Um, please do take heed to everything that she said. Go over the presentation again before you make your decisions. And we wish you all good luck in your in your joint ventures or whatever it is you happen to do. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Bye bye.